All right, let's dive right in. We're gonna talk about the next massive leap in wireless tech, 6G. And look, this isn't just about your downloads getting faster. We are talking about a complete reinvention of what a network even is. A network that doesn't just connect us, but one that actively senses the world around us. Now this creates a huge problem. How can one system be great at two totally conflicting jobs at the same time? Well, there's a really clever AI trick that solves this, and we're gonna get to it. But first, let's unpack this incredible new power. I really want you to think about this question for a second because it is the heart of everything we're about to cover. What if the very same network that brings you video calls could also spot an unauthorized drone near an airport, or see a pedestrian step onto a foggy highway, or even watch your hand gestures to control a machine? I know it sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, but this is exactly the world that 6G is promising to build. So first up, a network that sees. How on earth do you give a network the sense of sight? Let's break down the core technology that really separates 6G from everything that's come before. The secret sauce behind all of this is a technology called Integrated Sensing and Communication, or ISAC for short. And, you know, the name says it all. The network is no longer just a pipeline for data. It's also becoming a massive distributed sensor, using its own signals to map the physical world in real time. It's a total game changer. This right here really shows you the fundamental difference. 5G is fantastic, right? It's great at connecting things that want to be connected. Your phone, your smart TV, all that stuff. But 6G with ISAC, it adds this whole other layer. It can sense passive objects. Things with no electronics, no chips, no way of talking back. We're talking about a person, a car, a piece of equipment in a factory. The network is going from just connecting participants to being aware of its entire environment. Okay, so that brings us to the next big question. How is this even possible? To get our heads around that, we need to peel back the layers and look at the physics. And you'll see, it's not magic, it's actually a brilliant new take on a technology that's been around for a long time, just supercharged for the 6G era. The core idea here is radar. We're all familiar with it, right? Air traffic control, the speed gun and police officer uses. It's the same basic principle. You send out a radio wave, it hits something, and a very faint echo bounces back to you. And by analyzing that echo, you can learn a whole lot about whatever it hit. So here's how it works in practice. A cell tower sends out its normal communication signal, usually something called an OFDM waveform. Now, while part of that signal is heading straight for your phone, the rest of it just radiates out, bouncing off everything in the area. A tiny, tiny fraction of that energy might hit a car and then reflect back to a receiver. So by measuring exactly how long that echo took to get back, the network calculates the car's distance. And by measuring the tiny shift in the echo's frequency, that's the Doppler effect, it can figure out its precise speed. And that brings us to the hardware that makes it all work, MIMO. Now, 5G already uses what we call massive MIMO, panels with dozens of antennas. But 6G is moving towards something called gigantic MIMO, with maybe hundreds or even thousands of tiny antenna elements. Think of it like this. A single antenna is like a flashlight, with one big wide beam. Gigantic MIMO, on the other hand, is like having thousands of tiny, perfectly synchronized laser pointers that you can steer electronically instantly. This gives the network unbelievable angular resolution. It can tell the difference between two objects that are right next to each other. And with that kind of precision, you're not just detecting a car. You could potentially detect the subtle vibrations of a bridge, or monitor a person's breathing from across the room, or even track the individual hand movements of a worker in a factory. It's like the network is painting the world with radio waves and seeing the reflections in high definition. Now, the network can arrange its eyes and ears in a few different ways. The simplest is monostatic where a single cell tower sends the signal and listens for the echo. But the big problem there is that it's like trying to hear a whisper while you're shouting. So a smarter way is bi-static sensing, where one tower transmits and a different one listens. That solves the interference problem, but they have to be perfectly synced up. The real goal, though, is multi-static sensing. This is where the entire network works together, multiple towers transmitting and receiving, combining all their data to create a complete 360-degree picture with no blind spots. And the signals themselves can be a bit different too. Old school radar often uses these short pulses of energy to measure distance, but ISAC is way more likely to use continuous wave signals, which, it just so happens, are a lot like the signals already used for communication. And these continuous signals are fantastic for measuring that Doppler shift to get super precise velocity data. This is so critical for things like tracking vehicles or even monitoring the health of a bridge by its vibrations. It's just a brilliant way of using what's already there for a completely new purpose. Okay, so section three, the AI optimization engine. 
We've got a network that can talk and see, but this creates a massive challenge. How do you manage a system that's trying to do two totally different, conflicting things at the same time? Well, the answer is AI, and not just any AI. This AI has to live at the very physical layer of the network, the deep down level where the radio waves themselves are being created. Why? Because these trade-offs are happening millisecond by millisecond, and only an AI that's built right in is fast enough to handle it. And here it is, the central problem. The perfect radio signal for sending data as fast as possible is often a terrible signal for getting a clear radar image. And the perfect crisp signal for sensing might be really inefficient for communication. It's a constant tug of war. If you optimize for one, the other gets worse. And trying to solve this with normal algorithms is just way too slow for a live network. This is exactly where the AI has to step in. So instead of training two separate AIs, one that's a communication expert and another that's a sensing expert, the solution is something called multitask learning or MTL. Think of it this way. An MTL model is one single unified AI. It has these shared layers at its core that learn the fundamental things about the radio environment that are useful for both jobs. Then it branches off into specialized layers that fine tune the output for communication on one side and for sensing on the other. By learning them together, the AI actually gets better at both jobs, finding clever trade-offs that two separate models would never discover. So how does the AI actually pull off this balancing act? Well, first, you give it its two goals. Number one, get the data through as fast as possible. Number two, get the most accurate location and speed of your target. Then, and this is the really clever part, you combine the error scores for both tasks into what's called a joint loss function. This creates a single overall performance score. And finally, the AI's entire job, moment to moment, is to tweak the live network, the shape of the radio waves, the direction of the beams, to get that combined error score as low as it can possibly go. It's constantly finding the perfect compromise. Now, making these decisions in real time is an insanely difficult computing problem. That's where a technique like algorithm unrolling comes in. So remember that AI puzzle I mentioned at the very beginning? This is the answer. It is a really clever way to take a complex traditional algorithm and basically unroll its logic into the very structure of a neural network. This essentially bakes the optimization process right into the AI, making it incredibly fast. Fast enough to run at the physical layer and make those split-second decisions a live 6G network needs. All right, we've gone deep on the how. Now let's get to the really exciting part, the so what. I mean, what can we actually do with a world that is being constantly sensed by our digital infrastructure? While the applications are pretty mind-blowing, in transportation, imagine a network that tells an autonomous car about a cyclist coming around a blind corner that its own sensors can't see yet. In a factory, it could guarantee that a giant robotic arm never, ever collides with a human worker. It could even let a worker in a deafeningly loud factory control a machine with simple hand gestures. And all of this leads to an even bigger idea, the digital twin. Because the network is constantly sensing its environment, it can build a live one-to-one -one digital copy of the physical world. Imagine a digital twin of an entire city that lets you simulate traffic patterns to eliminate jams, or a digital twin of a factory that lets you predict when a machine will fail before it happens. This is really the ultimate goal, a network that doesn't just connect our world, but truly understands it. And that brings us to our final section, an unblinking network. Okay, we have seen the incredible, almost utopian potential of this technology, but this kind of power comes with enormous responsibility. A network that can see everything raises some very serious questions about privacy. Specifically, if the network can see someone who never opted in, how does that possibly work with privacy laws like GDPR? Let's get right into that challenge. This quote from Ericsson Research just cuts right to the heart of the problem. The way we've always handled data privacy is based on consent. You click, I agree on the terms of service, but how does a pedestrian walking down the street consent to being sensed by the 6G network? How does a car driving down the highway? As the researchers themselves say, a consent-based model just seems completely infeasible for this kind of passive wide area sensing. This forces us to ask a really direct and really difficult question. Who's responsible here? Is it the mobile network operator? Is it the company that builds an app using the sensing data? Is it the government that regulates it all? We are building a technology that will create a staggering amount of data about our physical world, and we honestly haven't figured out the rules to government yet.
You know, walking this privacy tightrope means facing some huge challenges. You've got data being collected from people who don't even know their users. That's in direct conflict with rules like GDPR, which are all built around the idea of a person knowingly sharing their data. There's a very real danger that this infrastructure could be used for unauthorized surveillance. And of course, just think about the security. Securing this massive new trove of sensitive location data is going to be an absolutely monumental task. So what's the answer? Well, the general thinking from experts right now is that the first wave of ASAC will probably need to steer clear of that ethical minefield of broad commercial use. Instead, the focus will likely be on applications that have a really clear, established legal basis. And we'll end on this thought. The technology to create an all-seeing network isn't a question of if anymore. It's a question of when, and more importantly, how. ISAC is a fundamental shift in how we relate to our digital world. It offers incredible safety and efficiency, but it also presents a surveillance capability on a scale we have never seen before. The challenge for all of us, the engineers, the policymakers, the citizens, is to build the rules and the ethical frameworks to make sure this powerful new vision serves us without turning us into the subjects of its unblinking gaze.